Hello, trainers, and welcome to the World Cup of Pokemon, hosted by Victory Road, sponsored by Elgato, GG Tour, and Metaphy, and cast for this last match by myself, Hayden McTavish, and the one and only Stefan Mott. How are you feeling about finals here, Stefan? I'm feeling great. I've had such a good time this entire season, and of course, today's been great as well. And uh, we've had some incredible games so far today. And, you know, to, to close it off, the way we're going to close things off today is going to be fitting, as I'm sure you guys will all agree when we see what we're getting ourselves into. Yeah, absolutely. Both of these teams have been steamrolling the competition, getting these really strong, convincing wins very consistently. But against each other, we're down to a 3-3 record and we're in the seventh set and everything is coming down to this. Just so exciting to be able to jump into this. And I think there's going to be so much brilliant play when the players have their hearts fully on the line here. Yeah, and it's come. we've come a long way from a few hours ago when this stream started. If we take a look at today's matches, it is a best of seven in the finals going all the way to game seven. 3-3, three, three. Kylan Van Severin, the senior representative, taking it game number one. Narowich and Papon claiming a couple of wins to put Thailand in the driver's seat before Matt, Tid, and Jean-Marc did the same, reversing it. Canada up 3-2 after match number five before Gunn taking down the defeated Navjit to make it 3-3 here. So many storylines, so many closely fought contested games, and we close things off with Neil against Panyawut, uh, two of the strongest players from both teams in a Game 7 that matters. It doesn't get much better than this. Yeah, absolutely. Both both teams definitely are really trusting that seventh slot to be able to bring this home. Um, I think Thailand has a lot of momentum, having been able to take down a player that on paper they might have thought they would have um, lost to. And Canada definitely still in that position, though, where they can get this win very easily. It really is all all down to this. And as you said, so many storylines, so many ups and downs of each side taking the lead and then beating the other back down to this last final situation. Just the definition of a back and forth match, I think it's fair to say. And, uh, you know, Neil, a solid World Cup out of Neil. Six and three so far. He's played every single match, I believe. So uh, he's been the staple for Canada, part of that backbone. He's a player that can play anything. I mean, when you think of Neil, at least when I think of Neil, I think of Neil's crazy wonky teams and things that end up on YouTube. But a lot of the time in these tournaments, he takes things a lot more seriously. He does play the more standard stuff, but a lot of the time, with a special Neil twist. It's always scary to face off against Neil because not only can he bring any archetype, but he can switch things up in ways that you don't expect while keeping the team very, very solid. Panyawut on the other side, one of Thailand's most consistent players, a world's representative, and somebody who has been slated as the last match multiple times in these playoffs. Really somebody who is okay with that pressure. It's going to be important to see, uh, it's going to be important to see whether or not Panyawut can, uh, can thrive under that pressure today in the match that matters most of all. I love what you just said there, that this really isn't just a match of Pokemon skill or technical skill or team building. It is a match of being able to handle the pressure of a really high stakes competition right down to the wire. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see what both of these players can bring to the field there. It's a great opportunity to learn from and a great opportunity to showcase a lot of skill. And there we see the com uh, the uh, results from these two players, the accomplishments. Paniwat, as mentioned, a world's competitor. He did get top four in Thailand's nationals this year. Uh, top 32 in Singapore nationals way back in 2016, so he's been around for a while. Compared to Neil, who's a bit of a newer player, uh, comparatively speaking, but has really established himself as a really... Uh, pivotal member of the scene. He's got a great YouTube channel. He's a great content creator. And while he hasn't really done that many uh, events offline, I don't know if he's been to any major events offline just yet, he is gearing up to take the 2023 season by storm, be very, very serious, and has just been so consistent online for, uh, for many, many months now. Yeah, every, every player on both of these teams' rosters, and especially these two players we're seeing here, are going to be such a formidable threat to look at in the future. Um, not just because of the accomplishments we're showing on here, but because of the fact that they are here, that they're in the finals of this match, that their teams trust them to play this finals in an incredibly competitive format against global competition. That These are the players that we're seeing in the very last match that we're streaming. That's just such an accolade to add to both of these lists, and both of these players definitely deserve this opportunity. 
I did mention that Neil has played all nine matches for Canada. The same is true for Panya Wood for Thailand. They've only played six because they did get to bypass that qualifying round, but Panya Wood has also played all six matches for Thailand. So the consistent trust of both teams has rested with these players. And now we see the teams. A fitting end to the World Cup as Panya Wood is rolling up with Edu's World Championship winning composition. Uh, there is always the chance that you switched up some items, some spreads, some moves. You don't want to look too deeply into that and, and assume too much if you're Neil. But Neil as well, using a team that has seen success. I believe this is the same team that Willie used earlier today. It is Ban Fox's uh, six from EUIC, where he did make day two. Again, though, with Neil being the pilot, I wouldn't be surprised to see a couple of things changed up on that team. Yeah, it's one of those really interesting things when you look at team preview, especially in a prep based format like this is great. I know what I would assume if I were in a tournament and I saw these six Pokemon. Um, but if I'm in this situation, A, I have to worry about the adjustments the player made for their own comfort. And B, I have to worry about the adjustments they might have made just so that when I make this assumption, I'm wrong and I'm in a really bad position because you just have to play a single set with these teams. And so definitely both players have to tread carefully in this game one to try to figure out if the information they're assuming is really correct. There's so many different ways to run Gastrodon, to run Thunderous, to run Zacian, and you have to worry about all of those if you're Neil, whereas uh, Neil has so many potential twists as you just brought up. Yeah, so I think we're ready to get into the game. I'm so ready, Hayden. Are you ready? Yeah. I'm so excited to see these first few leads. Um, there's so much interesting interactions we could see here. The Aveltal, the Zashans, and the Calyrex. Um, just a lot of good inter restricted interactions. But we're seeing a start with just Incineroar and Gastrodon coming out against all the restricteds from the other side of the field. All right, a slow start here from Panya Wood, opting to uh, slow things down. You get the Intimidate there off on that Zashi, and that's always nice. And of course, the, the threat of yawns from that Gastrodon, really forcing your opponent to position into you in ways that Panya Wood's hoping to be able to uh, take advantage of. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see just the vastly different approach these two teams have to the start of this game, starting with the two best established pivots versus some of the most well-established offensive Pokemon that still have a good amount of bulk to them. And I'm really curious to see um, how Panya was able to position this into a favorable situation later on, or if Neil's able to sort of steamroll through this defensive play and be able to put himself in a strong position. Uh, one of the first things that's a little bit interesting to note is the Zashian's uh, HP stat is not super high. It definitely has some bulk in there, but it's not going to be crazy, crazy bulky, which means that something like an Earth Power coming out of that uh, Gastrodon, if it decides to go for a hard read, is probably going to do pretty sizable damage. But it is just going to be that Yawn onto the Veltal here, already forcing the, uh, the opponent, in this case Neil, to uh, either switch things around or go to sleep. Yeah, the, the standard trade that uh, Yawn forces. I think it's really interesting to see both Pokemon just starting with their most consistent way of forcing the opponent to burn turns. This Eveltal is definitely not going to be able to do anything it wants. It's either attacking or it's it, or it's switching out, and if it attacks, it goes to sleep. Um, but Neil just sort of trying to find a way to still get damage through regardless. You don't have to attack every single turn. There is a lot of pressure on the Incinor on the Gastrodon from this Sashin. And so it's going to be interesting to see sort of what trades Neil accepts and what trades Neil doesn't to try to get into a better position here, whereas Panyu definitely is sort of has a lot more tools for controlling the pace of this game for the moment. Yeah, and of course the Intimidate already coming down on that Zashi and leaves the Incineroar free to potentially parting shot whatever's coming in for that Yveltal side of things and just continue to slow things down. Make it so that Neil can't dish out the massive damage that some of these highly offensive Pokemon are able to do usually. You know, 145 base attack on that Landorus is a ton of damage, but the Intimidate already being able to uh, keep that Incineroar alive, but it's actually going for a Flare Blitz instead, saying, well, you know what? I'm done taking things slow. Big damage into the Zashian. The Incin will knock itself out there with the recoil. Is this going to be a double up into that Zashian? Is it an Earth Power? No. It's a yawn right back into that Landorus. Yeah, doing what Gastrodon does best, forcing a single slot to just switch forever or accept a sleep. Um, but really important to see that um, that Incineroar was comfortable pivoting to offense. I wonder if we'll see something like that Calyrex Shadow coming in later and really capitalizing on the fact that the Zashian is now low enough to be in an Astro Barrage range, or if it's just sort of getting that damage down so that there's the threat of that Earth Power later. Maybe Gastron didn't go for it yet, but it always can going forwards now. And sure, you've lost your Incineroar, but this Zacian is definitely not in a great spot to be able to take hits going forwards. 
yeah, that is one of the most uh, you know common ways to pilot these Calyrex Shadow Rider teams. You want to take things down to being low HP without actually KOing them a lot of the time, just to ensure that you can get those Astral Barrage, uh, the the uh, Astral Barrage KOs to get the Grimnay boosts to uh, sort of snowball from there. But of course, with the Aveltal being a Pokemon that Neil has, it becomes a bit of a positional battle in that regard as the Landorus leaves the field for that Reggie Alecki. Gastrodon also choosing to leave the field as Zacian is confirmed as the final Pokemon for Paniwats. There is not going to be the threat of any Astral Barrages in this game. Yeah, no Astro Barrages, but definitely a Dynamax coming out here. Um, still a lot of pressure here, but definitely important, um, especially seeing the HP stat on Neil's Zacian. If that Zacian is really fast, it might still have an opportunity to get another one or two hits off before it goes down. And I think even with that Intimidate, that's got to be really nice if you're Neil to get a little bit of damage down before you trust the other Pokemon on your team to clean things up. As we do see the Behemoth Blade come out uh, into either Pokemon, it would do an extraordinary amount of damage, most likely going to be that Thunderous, um, and it's able to take it down, not quite to half, but at least getting some good damage off on a Dynamax Pokemon gives you some options going forwards, as we see the Max Airstream in return into that Regieleki. Yeah, this is a fantastic turn for Ponyo. What a lot of the time, these Zacians will be built to, at the very least, uh, especially if you have an Airstreamer on the team, outspeed Regieleki at plus one. Thunderous confirming that Life Orb as well, and now... Well, the question really is, what does the Zacian on Ponyo's side target? I, I think the Thunderous, of course, is still going to be slower than that Regieleki. So maybe Regieleki can make something happen here. But Neil is in a tough, tough spot here in this game number one. Yeah, just a brilliantly set up Airstream to have the Zacian in position to do a whole lot of damage. Um, we don't have a whole lot of defensive pivots. Um, I don't believe that that Rotom Heat is in this game. And so uh, Neil definitely going to have to take a lot of damage from the Zacian for the foreseeable future, depending on how this targeting works out. If the Regieleki is faster, that gives some options. But if that Zacian, as you mentioned, is faster and goes for Beam with Blade into the slot, that's just a KO. And Ponyuit still has another turn of Dynamax and some more turns of this Zacian using the fact that it basically has a Dragon Dance up. It has the speed boost from Airstream and the attack boost from Intrepid Sword. Um, it doesn't much matter what this Thunderous does, but it's going to be able to do a good chunk of damage through this Zacian um, and just maintain that pressure going forwards. Well, the Zacian does survive here, and of course, one of the things that is going to be uh, potentially pivotal here is that uh, Ponyawa does only have one turn of Dynamax left, so Neil still has the ability to Dynamax one of these two remaining Pokemon in the back. Landorus could Dynamax right now and go for a big move into that Zashi and try to go for a Quake KO or something, but it looks like Neil is instead going to either... It looks like he's going to opt to try to stall out this last turn a little bit more effectively. Um, maybe see if Sucker Punch can do a lot of damage. Like maybe Sucker Punch Quick Attack, even picking up the, Landor uh, the Thunderous maybe? That could be an interesting play. Yeah, it's interesting to see that Neil does have so many priority options. I think those aren't something that I typically think about a lot when I think about Zacian and when I think about a bulkier trained Ivelto, but they both have so much priority options. And yeah, you, you called this out and this definitely looks to be a potential consideration. Um, even just getting off the quick attack now and saving that Sucker Punch for later, um, there's definitely some options for trying to manage this Dynamax and that is the crucial resource Neil still has, is having that Dynamax fully available for the rest of this match, whereas this is the last turn for Ponyu, as we see the Landorus switch in. Yeah, looks like a, an attempt to bait the Max Lightning into that Yveltal here. Thunderous is defiant, is going to allow it to just remove that Landorus from this plane of existence if it opts to go for an Airstream. So that's going to be the big question right now. Behemoth Blade coming in from this Zacian. Which Pokemon is this going to be targeting? It looks like it's going into the opposing Zacian. So the big question now is, Max Lightning or no Max Lightning? Uh, Neil is putting the entire game on this one attempted read, and he gets it! Max Lightning does not affect Landorus. The final turn of that Dynamax has been stalled. That was one of very few ways Neil had to manage that turn, um, because you have to give it the Defiant Boost if Landorus is on the field, and if Evelf is on the field, then it has to take that electric attack, and Neil found the way. Um, as you mentioned, just riding, riding everything on that moment, but now you've gotten through Dynamax, Thru the Thunderous has an attack boost, but you have Sucker Punch, and this Landorus is in such a great position to Dynamax here. What an absolutely stellar play there by Neil, realizing, okay, once the Dynamax is over, I can just Sucker Punch this Thunderous. It's not going to be a threat anymore. Opting to uh, put it all on the line and making that read. Panyawut playing a pretty safe game up until that moment, and, just pro and Neil was too, to be fair. So thinking, you know, maybe Neil's not going to risk everything in a Grand Finals Game 7 on, on getting this read correct, but you know what? Neil doesn't care. Neil is willing to make those reads, and he gets that one. 
it really just comes down to whether or not um, the, the Zacian can pull something crazy off here. The Zacian, of course, is going to be faster than this Landorus. Behemoth Blade is going to give it an opportunity to, to hit into that for pretty massive damage. Thunderous going to leave the field as well. I like that call. Uh, reading that potential Sucker Punch as Gastrodon makes its way back onto the field. Yeah, so forcing Evelto to commit further turns to try to manage the Thunderous, giving Thunderous the option to come in later. Um, we do get to see this Dynamax. Um, as you mentioned, though, that Zacian is going to be able to have an opportunity to say something about this Landorus or this Evelto's HP stat before it has to go down to that Max Quake. Um, and if there's ever a Pokemon you want in an endgame, when you can get some damage down to Pokemon already, this Gastrodon might still have some options going forward for the rest of this game. Still rough for Ponyaboot, but definitely finding, oh, a lot of ways into this game, and that substitute changes a whole lot right now. Oh, that's a brilliant play there by Ponyaboot to stall out this first turn of Dynamax. Uh, the Landorus is going to be able to one-shot that thing easily, regardless of uh, whether it's at 75 or 100. So you don't really mind losing that 25%, and this allows you a free turn to reposition that Gastrodon onto the field. Just a really, really well-played turn there by Ponyaboot to reveal that substitute at the critical moment. I don't know if there's a safe way to get rid of this Zacian at, at this point. I think you can try to keep double targeting into it if you if you wanted to, um, but with sub and protect and being able to get Yawns out up from that Gastrodon, there's just so many things that Ponyuit still has that he can do. And then if you do ever have that Evelto go to sleep, that Thunderous does get to come in and start doing a little bit more damage, get maybe a wild charge off. And so there's just so many options so from Ponyuit's side of the field, and this endgame is really shaping up to be something really interesting. I like this play here from Neil. Just wanted to make sure that he doesn't get yawned. It's the best opportunity he has to remove this Gastrodon from play. And the speed boost is also going to allow him to essentially neutralize that Thunderous in the back. The big question is, what does the Zacian do? Neil is hoping for a sub or a protect here from the Zacian uh, because the Zacian can start to get a little bit of offensive momentum as it's using the Behemoth Blade, most likely going to be into that Landorus. How much damage does this do? Not enough for a one at KO, but enough to put on a lot of pressure, Hayden. Yeah, there's so much damage onto this Landorus. It does get the Airstream off. It gets this Gastrodon down low. Can the Evelto finish it off? If it can, that puts us in a situation where Neil can really put in a lot of pressure. Landorus doesn't have to have a lot of HP. It just has to have something. But it's almost, it's getting so low, especially with Life Orb. Um, Oblivion Ring coming out. Is that going to be enough to take this Gastrodon down? If it's not, that's so bad. But Gastrodon goes down. Neil's in a position where if you're able to get just these last few attacks off with the Landorus, it has the speed advantage. You're faster than everything else on the field. Um, and you got that KO, as you called out, Stefan. Blocking that yawn was so important for this endgame. Uh, the Landorus is still going to be slower than that boosted Zacian, though. The plus one airstream on that Zacian right. earlier is going to be a huge deal here. Uh, it's going to be tough. The, the Zacian is intimidated, I believe, from the Landorus coming in. So if it doesn't have play rough, then it might have a little bit of problems, a little bit of uh, trouble dealing with the Yveltal. Um, but this is still a very rough position for Neil. Ponyo, what's done a great job positioning himself, and the Thunder is being ignored here, uh, and that's gonna be great for Neil. Protect comes off. Let's see what the Zashin goes for. It's gonna be that Behemoth Blade. If that's if that's taking down that Landorus, that's gonna make things really tough for Neil, barring a couple of things that this Avelto could maybe do. That Landorus is going down. That Airstream boost from earlier being just so phenomenally important here. Um, and we're going to have to see how much this Evelto can do in return. If it's able to do enough damage with two hits and maybe take things pretty well, there's a chance. But against a Pokemon with Substitute, and oh, that good that damage. might finish it off. Yeah, but Zacian has damage. Substitute, and, and there's so many options to still handle this so well from Ponyu's side of the field. I'm scared about clicking Substitute if I'm the Zacian player here. Snarl as a sound-based move ignores Substitute and is boosted by the Dark Aura, so I'm not convinced that Zacian will be able to survive a crit Snarl, something like that. Uh, but we do have Behemoth Blade coming out once again. The big question is, does this 2-hit KO? If it 2-hit KOs, then it's probably all she wrote. Oh, that's gonna be close, Hayden! This might come down to a roll. Snarl needs to pick up the Thunderous KO, and it does! Does? Oh, okay. <laughs> So we're down to just that Zacian and just this Evelto. Can the Evelto survive another Behemoth Blade? If it can't, that is the game. And if it can, then... Ah! Okay, this is all coming down to a single damage roll in this first game. And then both players are going to have to have a whole lot of adjustments for how to handle these situations here. These restrictions are so threatening on each side of the field. The same roll that we saw in the last uh, attack will not be enough. It did 106 damage. It has 110 HP and it's enough! Zashian picks up the KO with the second Behemoth Blade. The higher roll comes through for Panyawut, and it's 1-0 for Thailand here in game number seven.
Wow, that was such a close game. I mean, we knew it was going to be. Both players are brilliant and trying so hard to get to the situation. But wow, it's so at high level Pokemon, sometimes it really does just come down to very subtle choices and effort value spreads. And that's absolutely what we came down to here. There were a couple of opportunities to make a few different reads um, earlier, but it really did seem like it was both players were playing down to a Veltal handling that Sashin, and it wasn't quite able to this time. And we'll have to check after the set how close that was, what the odds were. We don't know yet, even. Yeah, the, the same roll happening a second time would not have been enough there. So uh, really a, a little bit of a, of a high roll needed there on that second attack at the very least. But a really interesting match there. You know, it looked really tough for a while. Back and forth, really. You know, Panyo put himself in a great position early on. Neil with some great plays, bringing himself back into that game and bringing it all down to that end game roll. It's going to be a close one, and I could definitely see Neil taking this to a game number three. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've seen from that last set that both players have the tools to win, and it's coming down to really subtle choices. Maybe a different read on a single turn would have meant that you didn't have to get down to this damage roll. A different damage roll would also have totally changed the way this, this happened. And so I think it's interesting to see if both players consider adjustments to their play or what they bring, or if they really go with the same thing and just sort of trust that the roles will be in their favor this time around. Yeah, so it's going to be very, very interesting to see how they approach this. You know, Neil was on the back foot a little bit from that lead. Uh, really, turns one and two did not go his way, especially taking that Flare Blitz damage. He did get the Incineroar KO with the recoil, but just having such a weakened Zacian uh, and also just having Airstream boosts onto the opposing Zacian just really made things difficult for Neil to deal with. That big read on the Max Lightning, bringing him back into it at the end of the day, Showing that Neil is more than capable of playing to uh, to weird and wonky win conditions. That snarl there at the end as well. As mentioned, it would have gone through substitute and been very, very good. It picks up the Thunderous. It's a bit of a, of a gamble, I guess. I, I don't know the damage rolls, but if it was a roll to KO the Thunderous, it's a bit of a gamble because you need to pick up the Thunderous. But Neil was comfortable, comfortable, bleh, bleh, confident enough to go for that move, and it worked out, at least initially. But uh, Ponywood... Training his Zacian very, very well, having just enough offensive capabilities about it to close out that game number one. Yeah, it really felt like that Zacian was the absolute MVP of this first game. Um, setting up that one speed boost very early on and leaving that Zacian in and not losing it for the whole rest of the game really did limit Neil's options so much that that Airstream didn't put the lander as faster like I had thought, that it puts you in this position where this Zacian really is just continuously attacking with that behemoth blade. There's nothing in this game except maybe Rotom Heat that really likes taking a Behemoth Flight, and Zasha being able to do that uh, with the speed advantage was just so phenomenally influential, and I think it's definitely up to Neil to find a way to handle that situation. If the other Zasha goes first all the time, how am I going to stop it? Yeah, the other interesting thing is I'm not sure we saw the speed interaction between the two Zasha, mm -hmm. uh, because they weren't interacting with each other on the same speed tier at any given point. So I'm not really sure whose is going to be faster here. We do see that there's not a, an insane amount of bulk into Neil Zacian, so it could be faster. But, uh, you know, here we have the Incineroar and the Gastrodon lead once again here from Ponywood, opting to slow the game down. But Neil saying, I will play your game, bringing out his own Gastrodon to probably do a couple yawns of his own. Yeah, and nice that we get to showcase the two Gastrodons showcasing the different color schemes. Um, but yeah, really important for Neil to adjust and see, look, the thing that set me behind in these first two turns was that I didn't feel like I had the same control over the board that Ponyu did. And so I think bringing Gastrodon is a phenomenally useful adjustment. Um, that Zacian was still able to do plenty against these two Pokemon, so not surprising to see that brought again. But I think this Gastrodon has a whole lot it can do to try to shift how these first two turns go at the start. I do like that one of the one of the running jokes and one of the running gags during this World Cup has been who's going to use the blue Gastrodon, who's going <laughs> to use the pink Gastrodon. It's been a point of contention uh, all season long, and now here we are in Game 7 of the finals, and we have pink Gastrodon staring down blue Gastrodon across from it. So I guess this is going to be the real decisive moment to decide <laughs> which Gastrodon is the objectively correct Gastrodon. Yeah, well, we're all, we're all deciding it here. Is the pink Gastrodon better? Um, we do see a nice Sacred Sword damage off from that Zacian into the Incineroar, but now we have that age-old question with the yawn of do you attack or do you switch? Um, and the Gastrodon on Neil's side wasn't able to start establishing that yawn pressure just yet because of the fake out from that Incineroar. So Neil feeling like he's a little bit behind on some of the positional aspects, but getting that damage off on that Incineroar is really big in turn. 
Yeah, of course, threatening hit, uh, threatening the Incineroar with a second Sacred Sword, giving Neil a potential early Pokemon advantage could be big. Of course, Ponyawa did lose his own Incineroar a little bit early in the last game and still managed to clutch it out. Uh, one of the big questions, though, is going to be, you know, is that Calyrex still in the back? Because Incineroar hasn't been able to deal any damage here this time around, so we're not in a position where uh, Astral Barrages are particularly scary just yet. There's the switch. We have the Veltal coming on in to eat a potential Flare Blitz if that was going to be the case. And uh, also, you know, protecting the Zacian from that yawn. So making sure that nothing goes to sleep this turn. Veltal does take a quite a bit of damage from that Flare Blitz, though. Going down to about two thirds. Um, Gastrodon using Yawn on Pinewood's side. I have a feeling I know what the Gastrodon on Neil's side is also going to go for. Um, and we see a whole lot of Yawn three times so far this game. I'm going to start a counter. Well, that's a really, really nice decision there by Neil. I, I think this is great for him, right? Because uh, his Gastrodon can continue to click Yawn and just sit on the field, while now mm. Pinewood is forced to make that decision. Do I Yawn Neil's Gastrodon as well and let mine go to sleep? Or do I switch it out? So that the Battle of the Gastrodons initially at least has been won, uh, potentially by the <laughs> Gastrodon here. And Yveltal, taking a bit of damage from that, that Flare Blitz, does still have the opportunity to go for something like an Oblivion Wing into the Incineroar if it wants to. That, of course, would mean that it would go to sleep, though. And Neil deciding that's not quite worth it, brings in the Landorus instead. Neil showcasing his whole team via switches every single turn. Um, Landorus is coming out, lowering that damage output on that Incineroar if it keeps trying to go for Flare Blitzes instead of pivoting out. Um, we do see the Gastrodon switching out. Panya does not want to accept sleep on the blue Gastrodon. Um, and we're going to have to see as the Zashin comes in without Intimidate. Um, if there's something that Neil's done to try to help manage that, or if Zashin's going to be in a phenomenal position to get a substitute off. U-turn coming on down there from that Incineroar, going to allow for a nice switch on into uh, whatever's in the back. And, uh, well... The, the big question here is, as you said, the, the Gastrodon. Is it going to be yawning that, that now Zashian slot again? I like this, though. The Gastrodon, right back on the field. Ponyo is <laughs> continuing to apply pressure with that Gastrodon. It's going to be an Ice Beam, though, coming into the Zashian. Uh, a Freeze, maybe? Nope, not this time around. <laughs> Yeah, so Neil may be trying to read into a different switch in or just get some damage off into that Gastrodon, but most likely trying to catch that Thunderous. And instead, that Zashian coming out. And just a wonderful play from Ponyo to say, I see that you're trying to stop my Gastrodon from being threatening. I can fix this in just one turn. I have Parting Shot on the field. And I think that that was really amazing because now this Gastron is right back at being able to do Yawn Pressure. Wow, the Zashin has so much pressure for Substitutes or Behemoth Blades. It's not a reduced attack. So that might just be a KO on the Landorus. We're seeing Landorus have to play defensively and the Zashin's totally capitalizing on it, getting that Substitute off. That's so huge. I actually think this is a pretty good turn for Neil uh, if he clicked Earth Power. I think he did click Earth Power. So breaking that sub is really, really nice because now all of a sudden, Panya with Zashian is within KO range for a Behemoth Blade on Neil's side if that ends up being something that he can click. Of course, you know, Intimidate's a factor and potential additional subs are a factor. But overall, I think uh, that was a very, very good turn for Neil. Uh, he gets basically free damage into the Zashian. Yeah, nice to get that damage off, um, but the cost of that Yawn on the Gastrodon also going to be something that Neil has to play around. Um, just trying to find the right way to position in that Zashin to take advantage of the damage, uh, where this Gastrodon from Ponyo's side is definitely going to do everything it can to make that difficult. Ooh, the uh, Gastrodon on Neil's side opting to stay on the field. That's an interesting decision here, as that Yveltal is definitely going to be going down. No Intimidate on the Zashian this time around. So big damage coming on in the first Restricted Falls. Ponywit this time putting himself at a bit of an advantage, as uh, let's see what this Gastrodon goes for on Neil's side. Ooh, takes a Spadef drop as well. Not what he wants to be seeing here, as Earth Power goes into the Zashian, dishing out almost enough damage no. to KO that. However, keep in mind... The Zashian on Neil's side does have access to Quick Attack, so even if it were slower, it does have the ability to KO that Zashian without taking damage itself. Yeah, absolutely. I think Gastrodon not quite doing the work that I think Neil wanted it to do. I'm getting a special defense trap, not getting that KO. Um, but as you mentioned, there is that power of that threat of the Quick Attack. Um, Going to be tough to figure out the right way to use it, though, as Neil is electing to bring in that Landorus. Still slower than the Zashian, still going to take a lot of damage from that Behemoth Blade. And I think that Neil may be thinking that playing to Airstream is more useful at this point, um, but it is tough to have to take so much damage from that Zashin and be sitting with an asleep reduced special defense Gastrodon. Yeah, this is a big read turn here from Neil with that reduced special defense here. Uh, the Gastrodon is at threat to go down. 
Uh, but the Landorus, of course, if it Dynamaxes, could just take a big Behemoth Blade to the face. So that's also really not what he wants to do. He's going for a bit of a read here, trying to kill off a turn of sleep, and it's going to work out nicely in Neil's favor. The mandatory turn of sleep has been stalled. The Gastrodon is going to be able to get a little bit of that HP back from the leftovers as well. So once again, a big read coming in for Neil to keep him in this game. And once again, he makes the correct play. Yeah, absolutely. I think it would have been amazing to be able to pivot that Zashin in as well, but that would have been extraordinarily risky for this Gastrodon. And burning the turn of sleep is really important too. Um, you really need to get every turn you can recovered, and this was a way to recover one of those Yawn turns without any cost. Um, the challenge here is though, Landorus has burned the Protect. It's definitely um, easy to target down with that Behemoth Blade plus Ice Beam. And once this Landorus goes down, you really have limited options from Neil. You have a sleeping Gastrodon and a Pokemon that only has single target moves in that Zacian. So definitely a tall order for Neil to find the right way out of this game. I think we're seeing Landorus going for something particularly interesting this turn to try to recover this game. Yeah, I feel like at this point, you're taking the same amount of damage from Behemoth Blade percentage-wise, regardless of whether or not you Dynamax. Landorus is going to survive this. He's going to be able to pick up a Zacian here with Rock Slide, and he's hoping for a flinch on that opposing Gastrodon. That's what he wants to go for here. Uh, we'll see. The Zacian goes down. Moment of truth here. A couple of things going on RNG-wise. A potential flinch and also a potential wake up. The flinch does not come in. Will the Gastrodon wake up? That's the next big thing, because now that Gastrodon is the only Dynamax option that Neil has left. Yeah, and it's at minus one special defense, too. It really needs to wake up, and it hasn't yet. Oh, that is so, so tough. Uh, depending on what Ponyu has in the back, um, that puts Neil in just an extraordinarily disadvantaged situation. There aren't a lot of options to handle the Gastrodon on Ponyu's side of the field, which could also Dynamax on that side. Alright, let's see. The Zacian's full HP. The Incineroar is low enough that even after the inevitable Intimidate, it will go down to a uh, Sacred Sword. Um, and of course, there is still that Dynamax possibility here for uh, for Neil. Uh, there's also still Dynamax for Ponyo with those, so that this is a, an awkward spot. I think the best case scenario is that that final Pokemon is Calyrex Shadow Rider, and that he's able to boost up the defense significantly enough. But uh, this is uh, becoming a very, very iffy game here for Neil. It's it's going to be very difficult for him to 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 get this to get the win here, but he's not out of it just yet. He needs to wake up this turn though. Yeah, um we're going to see the Dynamax come out on the Gastrodon. Um you're going to try to repair that reduced special defense. You're going to try to be able to start getting damage off because the Sasha needs some help to get through this whole team. Uh, going to attempt to wake up. Um, this is going to be really crucial. There's a 50-50 chance of whether this Gastrodon wakes up this turn or whether it stays asleep. Neil really needs everything he can get here as the Zacian elects to protect, hopefully catching some targeting into that slot on Neil's end. Um, we're going to see if Ponyu read into that, and he did, getting that U-turn off into the Gastrodon. Bringing something else in, having the option to intimidate in the future is just so huge going forwards. What is that final Pokemon? If it's the oh, it's the Thunderous! Oh, now it doesn't even matter if this Gastronaut wakes up if the target is the Thunderous. I'm not sure which one was targeted by that Max Quake, but it doesn't matter anyway. It's a three-turn sleep on the Gastrodon, and that means that when that Incineroar comes back in, it's going to be a minus one Zashin here. The opposing Gastrodon back to full HP as well. Oh uh, well. It looks like Ponyo with the Gastrodon is faster, so at least it won't be able to yawn the Gastrodon on Neil's side this turn. That's a slight positive. Yeah, a tough situation. I believe that Max Plague was into that Gastrodon. But yeah, we do have this turn here where Gastrodon is on paper asleep, but really just can't be hit by yawn and will definitely wake up. Um, we do see Ponyo just continuing to stack up those Intimidate drops, though. Gastrodon on its own might not have the offense to finish off this game, and this, this Zacian is not going for attacks, it's trying to survive these turns. It's not succeeding, and it's not going to be doing a whole lot of damage as the Yawn comes out into it. Um, so that Zacian's going to be asleep very soon, especially with that fake out pressure. Max Quake's going to come out, going to boost the special defense, but that might be too little too late from the little pink Gastrodon. Hasn't really put in work for Neil so far. Although that's a lot of damage from that Max Quake. Yeah, I think Neil really may have needed a crit there on the Gastrodon. That might have been the out that he needed to go for. Uh, double Protect, I'm not really sure what that gains him there. But at this, at, uh, what's the out here? There's another Yawn coming into the Gastrodon, I would assume. Uh, fake out here into the Zacian is also pretty free. It's tough. It's really, really tough. Uh, the With the Thunderous in the back, that thing is still going to have a lot of offensive pressure when it Dynamaxes. So this is going to be uh, another turn where I think at this point, Neil needs to rely 
on Ponyuit making a mistake. If this is a damage roll, potentially, and there's no Protect on the Gastrodon, maybe he's able to pick that up. There is no Protect on the Gastrodon, okay. So maybe a crit on the Gastro gets him there? We'll have to see. Yon coming out, gonna put this Gastrodon to sleep soon. It's gonna join its, its buddy Zasha in a, a sleep very shortly, but if this Max Quake gets the KO with a higher roll or a critical hit, that could give an option, and it doesn't. This Gastrodon's gonna have a chance to Leftovers right back up. Wow, all of Neil's side goes to sleep. That's the last turn of Dynamax, I believe. And that's going to mean that Neil is really struggling to put out offensive pressure for the rest of this end game. Okay, let's see. There, I, I feel like there is a potential out here for mm -hmm. Neil. Uh, you know, obviously, sleep turns are an amount of RNG that, that does need to be considered here. But uh, the real question is, do you just double into the Zashi in here? Do you, do you just Earth Power Flare Blitz on this first turn of sleep? And, uh, and try to pick up the KO that way, because you know your Gastrodon is... Unless somehow this is a speed tie on the Gastrodons that Neil has been consistently losing all set, <laughs> that is something? Uh, but this is a, a very, very weird spot. There is full HP on the Gastrodon on Neil's side for the most part, so maybe it can find a way through. Flare Blitz maybe KOs the Zash... Uh, maybe it KOs both? Flare Blitz taking Zashin almost all oh, the way down. Doesn't take dude. out either Pokemon. <laughs> And yeah. the Earth Power finishing everything off is gonna gonna close things down. Gastron had the chance to do something one last time, but it's gonna be asleep and there's gonna be a whole lot of opportunities to take it out, especially because, sure, it's gone for that Max Quake, but it's not as far ahead as it, it wants to be. Um, and take Huge that Gastron. <laughs> <laughs> gets the critical hit it needed last turn just a moment too late. Um, and it has leftovers, it has a lot of hit points, but there's a whole Dynamax slash on Ponyuit's side of the field and two Pokemon that can attack into a sleeping Gastrodon. It's gonna make it really tough for Gastrodon to do anything for the rest of this end game. Yeah, of course, uh, being Yawn and not something like Sleep Powder, the Gastrodon has not been asleep for a turn yet. It hasn't taken that first turn. It doesn't have a chance of waking up here. So uh, this is gonna need to be some insane turn of events to make this happen. Uh, if the Gastrodon can survive this hit, then maybe a double protect stalls out the Dynamax and then Thunderous' only attacking move is fly. I, like, maybe? I think that's how you have to play it. But uh, there's, I, I respect Neil for staying in, seeing what you can do. A turn one wake up double protect is a very low likelihood of uh, something that can happen, but maybe, maybe. Play to the out. Hope that it exists. Yeah, the challenge is um, this first turn you can't protect, and the double up from the Thunderous and Van Cenerar is already going to take this Gash run so low, and then even when you're protecting, you're getting hit through that. Um, we'll have to see how much damage happens here, but with a max oh, knuckle on the Thunderous, too. <laughs> setting itself call. up to just do so much damage here. As you mentioned, a great call, and just so much damage going to come out this turn, and every future turn now, these are permanent attack boosts on these Pokemon. All right, well, we'll see. There should be a Dark-type move on this as well. Darkest Lariat coming out. Going to be spinning his way to a potential KO, maybe? No, not quite enough. Even with that max Knuckle Boost, the Gastrodon survives to fight another turn. Um, but at this point, even if you get the Double Protect, is another max Knuckle into max Airstream enough to KO through Double Protect? I feel like it probably is. Ponyawut has positioned himself to an incredible 2-0 win here over Neil. Just great, great play as the Thunderous closes up the set, closes up the match, and gives Thailand the title of BGC World Champion. Wow, just an incredibly well-deserved title. That was a very, very well-played endgame. So much nuanced understanding of the teams being able to play that first game down to having a good chance of winning and the second game down to the point where it just felt completely in Ponyuit's control just absolute mastery of the game super well played from Neil really giving Canada that chance to come back but ultimately Thailand showing why they're just the country to watch going into these next world cups into the next year of tournaments they've done so much work to put themselves in this spot where they are the champions they've won it and they've really deserved it a huge congratulations to Thailand, and there's not even much of a question of this being a fluke because they already pulled off a top eight performance last season, just showing this incredible consistency, showing that they are not to be overlooked. What an incredible run from an incredible team, and uh, it's just it's awesome to see a team like Thailand come out, a team that I think... I feel like a lot of the Southeast Asian national teams are respected as being good, but not fully respected as for how scary they actually are. And Thailand has proved that once again, definitively by taking this world championship down. It's such a strong wake up call that like Thailand is 
a country of phenomenal world-class players that can absolutely take co any competition. And I think that that's going to be something important for players to keep in mind going forward. So you can't just keep your eyes on a Western sphere or on Japan. There's so many other countries that are so strong, especially Thailand. And so, so awesome to have that reminder to see just an extraordinary performance, not just in this last set, but this whole bracket has been incredible from Thailand. Yeah, and looking at this bracket, of course, nothing to take away from Canada's incredible run either. Going through, uh, they, they had some tough groups before going into the top 16, facing down against a Taiwan side that was part of eliminating Spain, the, the reigning champions, and they managed to take that win over Taiwan. And then they went up against the team in the top eight with the best win-loss ratio in mm -hmm. India. So Canada claiming some incredibly strong results, and then that Australian team that was really just taking names like nobody's business right up until top four but thailand i mean i, I feel like that bracket is uh you know it, it shows the deservingness of this title you take out japan you take out the team that defeated the united states you take out poland who was really the dark horse on a lot of people's radars after their incredible group stage performances and uh just what an incredible tournament from both of these teams and what an awesome tournament of storylines that we've had all the way through this entire world cup Absolutely. So many storylines, so many players being able to be highlighted at the forefront uh, because they're helping their teams get through just incredibly well-renowned uh, and well-accomplished players. Um, so amazing to see Thailand coming out on top. And yes, as you mentioned, Canada really did beat so many teams that I was very much considering could have totally taken this whole tournament. And so both of these countries, countries to really watch next year in this World Cup and players to watch going into this next season of competitive Pokemon. Yeah, and of course, a huge shout out to all four of the top four teams who have earned themselves part of the prize pool that was so uh, that was made possible by the wonderful sponsors that we have here. And uh, we we just look at these uh, these matchups from the finals one more time as well. Just incredible diversity in the teams that we saw. Very few repeat teams. And uh, seeing both a mix of, you know, the standard ones. We saw Edu's team close it out at the end. We saw some Rinya Sun in there. But then we have a mixture of some of the more crazy teams. David Kutech's world's team in there. That crazy counter team from Gun. Just some awesome, awesome teams being used here in this finals as well. Yeah, looking at the diversity of these teams, it's just so apparent that both teams put in a huge amount of preparation going into these sets. I think that's one of the biggest places where a team can really set themselves apart is helping each other to prepare with a good team that has a good matchup into the opposing side. And it really felt like both sides were doing that so consistently this whole tournament. And so I think that's really shown in the fact that sometimes there were standard teams played very well. Sometimes there were really hard counter teams that worked super well. And sometimes there was a mix of all kinds of different things, things that players were comfortable with that maybe weren't standard, but worked really well. And uh, now we've, we've talked a lot about the teams, but how about the individual players? There is an MVP award that needs to be awarded. And if you've been paying attention to this broadcast, you probably have an inkling of who might be getting that MVP award for the World Cup of VGC 2022. And there it is. Navjeet Joshi with that 8-1 and one record claiming the MVP Boss van der Heiden doing an incredible job with an undefeated 6-0 performance in that second place as well, winning 12 out of its 14 individual games. And then Christopher Kahn's 7-1 with a slightly higher win rate in games, clinching out that third place over his teammate Henry Rich. Yeah, I think all of these players just so scary to look at going forwards into future tournaments. You can't have this strong of a record if you aren't just incredible at this game. And I think we've seen in a lot of matches these players showcasing just how strong they are. So congratulations to NJ for something extremely well-deserved, bringing Canada up to that second place and helping them there. So, so useful. And, and all of these players really establishing themselves um, as valuable players for their teams, uh, to say the least. Now, these stats are fun, and I like statistics. I think a lot of us like statistics. That's why we like VGC. So if you want to see more statistics, definitely go to the WorldCupVGC.com website. Uh, there's a lot more statistics where these ones came from. You can look at things like usage stats, things like win rate percentage for both players, countries, Pokemon. There's so much stuff to get lost in on the website, so I highly recommend checking out that website, which you can see at the bottom of this screen right here. And, of course, follow the rest of Victory Road socials. Are there matches that you missed out on? 
go to the YouTube. There's plenty of, of VODs there. Did you only watch the stream? Well, there's exclusive games that only got recorded for the YouTube. So you got to go check those out now. And of course, follow VGC Victory Road on Twitter to see more Victory Road action. Victory Road, of course, a team that, uh, you know, they put on the World Cup. But they also do a lot of other really awesome stuff. And, uh, it, you know, from, from articles rounding up the major events to their own tournaments, Victory Road is a cornerstone of the VGC community. So if you're not following all of these socials, what are you doing? Go do it now. Absolutely. You do not want to miss so many of the matches that have been able to be showcased for these past 10 weeks, especially if you've gotten to the end of finals and you didn't see every single set of finals, you're going to want to see every single set of finals. You're going to want to go back to YouTube or to the VOG and you're going to want to be able to watch those. Top four was an incredible set of matches as well. So many of the ones that are YouTube exclusive and weren't streamed are really good. And so make sure that you catch those if there's something that you had in mind, if you really enjoyed some of these games, make sure to check out the rest of what we've done. And of course, none of this would have been made possible without the sponsors, the partners of this event. So a huge, massive, mega shout out to Elgato, GG Tour, and Metaphy for making everything possible. Uh, the World Cup, the best World Cup we've had, I think. And I think next year will continue to be the best one yet. Every single year, the, uh, the, the World Cup just keeps getting better. And it's been an absolute pleasure to be part of it this time around. Yeah, thank you so much to all of our sponsors. Um, really was amazing to have the opportunity to continue upping the quality of the stream, the level of play that we're able to showcase, the stakes of the matches. All of those things were made possible by our sponsors. We're getting to the close of... Go ahead. I was also just going to give a brief shout out to the team over at Victory Road. You know, everybody from the casters to, of course, you know, we're on camera. You guys know that we're... <laughs> a part of it but there's so many people who are not on camera who deserve so much respect and support the admin team the tos the people in the back end running the production on the stream the running the website evan doing the stats i mean evan, evan's also on camera so he, he gets double the love but uh but there's so many people involved to make this an incredible experience for everybody involved and i hope that all of you have enjoyed coming along this journey with us as much as we have enjoyed bringing it to you Absolutely. Um, a heartfelt thank you from all of us uh, for watching the stream, for making this a thing that we can continue to showcase, for continuing to refine this game of Pokemon. I, I really do believe that this is just one of the most beautiful video games in the world. It is so exciting to have the chance to showcase this at so much quality. And yeah, huge thank yous to our sponsors, to our production team, to, to Stefan for casting with me. Um, and thank you to all of you, the viewers, for continuing to show interest in this game that is just phenomenal. A heartfelt thank you from both of us. We will see you guys next year for the World Cup of VGC 2023. Stay tuned, and I can't wait. Scarlet and Violet's going to be amazing. Can't wait to see what the Victory Road team cooks up. We'll see you guys next year.